address. So problems that naturally arise both in the internet and other similarly large and heterogeneous networks naturally pose a number of new problems for which I think, uh, new challenges for which I think traditional algorithmic techniques are not particularly well suited. So there's a number of such challenges posed by such problems. Uh, in this talk, I'm only going to focus on one of them, namely that there's often some notion of interaction between different agents uh, who in general have different objectives. And in this talk, when I use the word agent, I just mean some generic term for a participant. It could be a person, it could be a company, it could be a computer, uh, whatever. So you don't have to look far on the internet to see examples of sophisticated interactions. You can think, for example, about two internet service providers, uh, two ISPs. So two ISPs probably have a bit of a competitive relationship, right? They're probably, for example, uh, competing for customers in a common market. But ISPs might also have a sort of a cooperative relationship, right? They might, for example, have entered into some kind of peering agreement whereby each ISP agrees to uh, carry and forward on the traffic that emanates from the other ISP. So because these kind of sophisticated relationships obviously play a fundamental role in the day-to-day -day operation of the Internet, researchers have recently been keen to model these kinds of interactions and design algorithms that work uh, in these kinds of environments. <clears throat> so I claim that traditional algorithmic techniques are not very well suited for these new type of problems. So why is that true? Well, if you look through the algorithms literature and also the literature for related communities, I think you'll find that typically when there's some notion of agent interaction, uh, that interaction is restricted to line one of two diametrically opposite camps. Uh, so often you find agents modeled as obedient, which is to say they will naively execute the instructions given to them by an algorithm uh, without considering the cost or benefits of doing so. That's obviously a convenient assumption from the perspective of algorithms design. Or in other contexts, you see people wanting to make minimal assumptions about agent behavior. And then the worst case approach is typically taken. Uh, and agents are modeled as adversarial, which is to say they'll do everything in their power to obstruct the rules of an algorithm design. Again, without consideration of the costs or benefits uh, of those actions. So a couple canonical subfields where you see this dichotomy in distributed uh, computing. You see often uh, faulty processors modeled as adversarial, non-faulty processors modeled as obedient. Similarly, in cryptography, there's usually a notion of an honest party that obediently follows a cryptographic protocol. And then there's some adversary who wants nothing more uh, than to break said protocol. Returning to the ISP example, uh, it should be clear that an ISP can't be faithfully modeled as either adversarial or obedient. Uh, right, so an ISP is not going to just naively execute instructions I give to it without considering the cost of those actions. Uh, but on the other hand, an ISP is not going to say grind the internet to a halt because that kind of adversarial behavior obviously has consequences for the ISP itself. So this disconnect between the new types of problems that people wanted to uh, tackle and sort of traditional algorithmic approaches has motivated a recent trend in the algorithms community and a corresponding new goal. So the trend is to think about problems where agents can exhibit a much richer class of behaviors than simply these two opposite ones uh, of adversarial and obedience. And then the obvious goal is to develop techniques for designing algorithms that in some sense uh, account for behavior by self-interested parties with possibly conflicting objectives. Okay. So once this goal is identified, a natural field to turn to, both for conceptual inspiration but also specific technical tools, is that of game theory. Because since that field's inception back in 1944, what game theory has in large part tried to understand is what happens you get a bunch of self-interested agents together uh, in a common strategic environment. So let me tell you a little bit, slightly more specifically, what I want to talk about uh, in this lecture today. I'll still be kind of vague on this slide, but I'll get much more concrete on the next one. Uh, so what I want to understand, what I want to discuss today, is how to understand the negative consequences of selfish behavior. And I say negative consequences in the sense that uh, any algorithm, the goal you want to achieve, is naturally going to be more difficult in the presence of self-interested agents than in the presence of obedient ones. Uh, and so this high-level question breaks down into uh, two related questions, which I'll pose now, and one of which I'll be answering throughout the talk. Uh, so the question I'm going to focus on today is, when are the consequences of selfish behavior assumed? And what I really want to understand here is what I really want mathematical techniques that will allow me to differentiate in a rigorous way between two kinds of situations. First, strategic environments in which selfish behavior is essentially benign, in which no matter what we did, no matter how we intervened, we could not significantly improve over the outcome of selfish behavior, versus the strategic environments in which there are severe consequences of selfish behavior. And so there's some kind of intervention to mitigate these consequences is clearly needed. Okay? And so I'm going to be discussing in part this concept of the price of anarchy, defined by Kutsupius and Pachyritru back in 1999, which aims to quantify the, severe, the, the consequences of selfish behavior, especially in networking environments. Okay? Now, there's an obvious sort of related question, which has done a lot of work on by a lot of different people, including some by myself, 
which is when you have a strategic environment where there are severe consequences of non cooperative behavior, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to mitigate those consequences? Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about that in this talk, but I'm happy to discuss the work that's been going on on that question over the past several years with any of you later today. Okay. And so I'm going to be focusing on one particular application, a mathematical model called selfish routing, which is a model of how self-interested agents might route traffic through a network that suffers from congestion. I'm going to be drawing on results from two different papers, one joint work with Ava Tardis from Cornell, which first appeared uh, back in 2000, and then also a paper of mine in 2002. So these results are now a few years old. They're, not, they're no longer sort of the cutting edge of the field, but because I wasn't exactly sure what the audience was going to be, I wanted to stick with the most basic results. So there's been lots of generalizations, and these ideas have been applied to lots of other applications, including bandwidth allocation and network design, but I'm happy to talk about those applications afterwards. But I won't have time to discuss them in the talk. Okay. All right, so let me begin, before I make any formal definitions, just give some motivating examples to illustrate both uh, this, this model of selfish routing as well as the kinds of consequences of non-cooperative behavior that can arise. So we're going to begin with about the simplest imaginable network and about the simplest possible routing decision uh, with which anyone might be familiar. Okay, so here's the situation. So there's a bunch of self-interested agents. Think of there being thousands and thousands of agents, each of which wants to travel from a node or vertex S to a second node T. Okay? So there are two routes available for the agents to travel. Each agent uh, gets to make whichever decision about which route they take. Different agents can take different routes if they want. And what makes the example interesting to think about is we're going to posit that the two different links have very different characteristics. In particular, they have very different sensitivity to the edge congestion. Okay? So associated with each edge will be a cost, which you can think of as, for example, the delay incurred by traffic from traveling across that edge. And the, simple, the bottom edge is simple to explain. Labeling it C of X equal 1, what I mean is that no matter what the congestion X of the edge is, any traffic using the bottom link will incur a cost of 1. And that's true whether it's completely uncongested or completely congested. By contrast, on the top edge, the cost incurred by traffic is going to grow with the edge congestion. Okay? And so precisely what I mean here is that if an X fraction of the population chooses the top edge to travel from S to T, then all of that traffic will incur X units of cost. So if the edge is fully congested, if 100% of the traffic takes the top edge, then they'll all incur a cost of 1. If 50% of the population is on the top edge, they'll all incur a cost of one half, and so on. Okay. So the first question I want to pose, and I want to think about for a second, is that given that we expect all of these agents to route in their own self-interest, what routing of the traffic should we expect to arrive? Well, to answer that question, I need to tell you what people want, and we're going to make a natural and simple assumption that everyone just wants to get from S to T as quickly as possible, incurring the minimum possible cost. Under that assumption, we have good reason to expect all of the traffic to take the top edge, for the top edge to be fully congested, and for the bottom edge to be completely vacant. Okay? So to see that, we could argue by contradiction. Suppose, uh, for contradiction, that a mere 1 minus epsilon fraction of the traffic chose to travel across the top link, and a misguided epsilon fraction took the bottom link. Okay. How would all the traffic then feel about this outcome? Uh, well, traffic on the bottom, of course, incurs a cost of 1. That's just true because the cost on the bottom link is always 1. And when they look at their colleagues on the top edge, who are incurring cost merely 1 minus epsilon, they'd be envious. Right? They'd realize that if they'd only switched to the top edge, they'd be incurring strictly less cost, cost less than and then conversely, once epsilon goes to zero and everyone's on the top edge, it's true that now that the top edge is fully congested, its cost has risen to one and it no longer affords a benefit over the alternative. But on the other hand, by switching, no one's cost drops. Everyone's cost just stays at one. So no one has an incentive to switch back. So with selfish routing, with routing by self-interested parties, we have good reason to expect the top edge to be fully congested, resulting in a cost of one incurred by all of you. So the second question I want to pose is, suppose now that someone imbued me with the power to dictate routes down to all of these agents. Could I use that power to improve over the selfish solution? It's not hard to see that the answer is yes. The dictatorial power would allow us to improve the outcome. Okay. 
to see that, suppose we split the traffic half half. Suppose we took half of the population, removed them from the top edge, and rerouted them on the bottom. So how would all the agents feel about this modification? Well, agents on the bottom edge would incur cost of one. But of course, that was the same cost they were incurring in the selfish outcome, so they would know so. And then everyone who's still using the top edge now enjoys a relatively uncongested ride they get from SCT incurring cost of only one half. So I've made half of the traffic strictly better off while making no one worse off, which I've argued is a clearly superior solution. So dictatorial control can improve an outcome relative to the selfish outcome. That's the point of this example. So now I'm going to explore a second example, which demonstrates that same principle, but also a couple others. Uh, it's a more subtle example, but also more famous that has its own name. It's called Brace's Paradox. So the idea of Brace's Paradox is to take a network, and look at the natural selfish outcome in that network, and then watch how that outcome changes as we augment the network by one additional layer. So here's the initial network. Uh, we, again, we have uh, origin S and a destination T. We have two nice node disjoint paths going from S to T. The X's and 1's here mean the same things in the previous example. One means the cost is 1 on that edge independent of the congestion. X means the cost of that edge is equal to the fraction of, pop of the population that's using that. So by symmetry, I claim the selfish outcome in this network should be splitting the, splitting the traffic half-half between the two paths because that equalizes the cost of the two paths of one and a half. Right? One plus one half, one half plus one. Now suppose that in an effort to alleviate the cost incurred by all of the traffic, you know, we harnessed some extremely powerful link technology and built what's intuitively a teleportation device, a method by which traffic could travel from the midpoint of the top path to the midpoint of the bottom path with cost zero, cost zero independent of the edge congestion. So how would this affect the cell jump? Okay. Well, the first observation is that this red routing of the traffic is not going to persist under the presence of this new zero cost edge. Why? Well, now the new path introduced by the new edge, the zigzag path, the cost along it is currently one half plus zero plus one half for a total of one, superior to the one and a half cost that everyone's currently incurring. So relative to the red path of traffic pattern, everyone has an incentive to switch to the zigzag path. So if we imagine everyone switching to the zigzag path in tandem, we get this green route. And now all of the extra congestion on the upper left and lower right edges has driven the cost of those two edges up to one. And as a result, has driven the cost of all three paths from S to T up to two. So this, again, is a sensible, stable outcome of selfish behavior. Since all the costs have, have, since all the paths have exactly the same cost, no one can switch paths and do better. Yet despite the fact we made the network intuitively only better by adding a zero cost link, somehow the outcome of selfish behavior is worse for everybody. Everyone's cost has jumped from one and a half to two. Okay. So Brace's paradox illustrates a couple of things. Right? Most obviously, it's a very counterintuitive phenomenon that exists in these networks. We make the networks better, and somehow the inefficiency of selfish behavior increases. Uh, it also furnishes a second example of how dictatorial control uh, can improve over a selfish outcome. Right? In the new network, if I had dictatorial power, if nothing else, I could dictate that everyone ignore the new edge, I could recover the red route of traffic, I could make everybody better off relative to the selfish outcome. And then the final thing I want to say about Brace's paradox is that, while it may seem just like a pathology, particularly to a certain class of routing networks, actually this very cute paper of Cohen and Horowitz, which appeared in Nature about 15 years ago, pointed out that it's actually a much more fundamental phenomenon. So Cohen and Horowitz pointed out that Brace's paradox also has analogs in certain physical systems. And my favorite example of Cohen and Horowitz is the following. It says, uh, you can take a bunch of strings, and you can take a bunch of springs, and you can tie these strings and springs together in a kind of mechanical contraption. And you can then hang a heavy weight from the bottom of this collection of strings and springs, which, of course, stretches out the entire contraption. It stretches out the strings, stretches out the springs. And then what they observed is you can take a pair of scissors and apply them to a top string in the middle of this contraption. Snip the top string. And despite the fact that this contraption is intuitively only weaker, the weight rises further off of the ground. Okay. And they proved that just by observing that the exact same equations that govern the physical equilibrium of this physical system of strings and springs are those equations that govern the selfish outcome from these traffic. 
And so, you know, it's a, it's, if nothing else, it's a cute example, but I hope it also demonstrates that, you know, while all of, all of the results I talk about are standard for these traffic networks, really analyzing phenomena that have seemed much more fundamental. So any questions? People like to ask questions about Grace's paradox. So, any questions before we move on? Will that at least permit me to recap? Was there a question? Um, yeah, so it's basically Nash equilibrium. It's a slightly different sense than what Nash used because it's not a finite game, but it's the natural analog of Nash equilibrium. So I call it someone West Coast time, so very important for the speaker of the Maryland office. So I hope I've convinced you by way of these two examples, this two node filling example, and by Brace's paradox, uh, that there's some interesting phenomena worthy of analysis in these suffix routing networks. And so what I'm going to prove to you uh, throughout this talk is results that bound the worst case magnitude of these phenomena, and in particular of the consequences of selfish behavior in these routing networks. But of course, to make any kind of formal statements, I need some kind of precise mathematical model to talk about. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is just formalize this routing network we already should have an intuitive feel for from the examples. So I'll give you a precise mathematical formulation of exactly what networks are, what are outcomes, what are selfish outcomes, and so on. Okay? All right, so here's what I mean by network. So in the parlance of commercial optimization, I would say we're talking about a multi-commodity flow network. So the ingredients of which is, well, first of all, we have a finite directed graph, so vertices V, directed edges E. Uh, we have k distinguished vertices, which I'll call sources or origins, S1 up to SK. These are the vertices from which traffic is permitted to emanate. You will assume the traffic emanating from the source SI has a destination T sub I that they want to go to. I'm going to assume that the demands are fixed and known. So for a given commodity, I'll call it, for a given source sync pair, SI, TI, we'll assume that there's a fixed amount RI of traffic that wishes to travel from the source SI to TI. And finally, as in the examples, we want to have a notion of network performance and how performance degrades under increasing congestion. And we will model that with cost functions on the edges. Okay? So each edge will have a cost C sub E. This was like 1 and X and 0 in the examples. Uh, we're going to make a couple baseline assumptions about these functions. They're non-negative. They're continuous. They're non-decreasing. Sometimes we'll put on more conditions, but the baseline conditions on cost functions are very continuous and non-decreasing. So, for example, in two node tuning example, we had one sourcing pair, we had one unit of traffic, and our cost functions were the identity function and the constant cost function of one. And with respect to the half half running traffic, we had cost one half on top and one on the bottom. Okay? So that's what I mean by a network that suffers from congestion. So what are the possible outcomes? What are the possible routing outcomes? Well, we're just going to use the language of traditional network flow theory to describe everything that could possibly happen in one of these networks. So a little bit of notation for a given path P, which maybe starts at a source SI and goes to a destination T sub I. S of P means the amount of traffic using that particular path P. Okay? And then a flow or a flow vector F is simply F sub P indexed over all possible paths for all possible sourcing pairs. And we will identify all possible routings of traffic with all possible flow vectors F. So if you want to have sort of a, a picture to keep in mind, Here's the various paradox network, and we have uh, some traffic using the bottom two-hop path and some traffic using the partially overlapping three-hop path. Okay? All right. But with selfish routing, we're not interested in completely arbitrary outcomes of routing. What we want to focus on is routings that are justified by some kind of game theoretic interpretation. Routings that we expect to arise when we're modeling is what would be chosen by self-interested agents. So if we make a couple of idealized assumptions, there will be a very clean answer to the question, what flows, what routings of traffic should arise from selfish behavior? And I'm going to call those Nash flows, or flows of Nash equilibrium, in an analogy with the Nash equilibrium concept that some of you I'm sure have heard about. So the idealized assumptions are as follows. First of all, remember the initial example. I said think of there being thousands and thousands of agents. So we're assuming a large population. We're assuming that uh, the network, that the traffic comprises many individuals, each of them controls a small fraction of the traffic. That can be relaxed, which I can talk about uh, at the end if you like. And then also, as I said in the examples, each individual's incentives, they merely want to get from their source to their destination as quickly as possible, given what everyone else is doing. Okay? So if we make those assumptions, a flow is at Nash equilibrium. 
uh, it has the following property. Okay. And pictorially, we should already have a good understanding of what these flows look like. So on the two-node two-link network, the half-half flow, which was the solution that we dictated down to the traffic, would not be a flow in Nash equilibrium, intuitively, because traffic on the bottom edge incurs cost one, while if they switch paths, they would get cost one half. Whereas the green flow would be a flow in Nash equilibrium, because everyone incurs cost one, but there's no way to switch paths to get costs strictly less than one. So how would you formalize that in a more general network? Well, a flow is at Nash equilibrium, or is a Nash flow that has the following property. Look at any path, say from SI to TI, that's in use by some traffic. That path should have minimum possible cost over all available SITI paths. Okay? If there was some other SITI path that had strictly less cost, then traffic on the first path would have an incentive to switch. Conversely, if everyone simultaneously on paths with minimum possible cost, then no one has an incentive to switch. That's a sensible, stable outcome of selfish behavior, and we will deem it a flow of natural equilibrium. Okay? So briefly, flows of natural equilibrium are those where everyone's simultaneously on minimum cost paths from their respective sources destinations. So <coughs> what you call a Nash equilibrium or Nash flow is the same thing as what, let's say, civil engineers would allow like user equilibrium. Exactly. That's not the next slide, actually. Exactly. Okay. So that's a Nash flow. That's what we're going to identify as the outcome of selfish behavior in one of these networks. Uh, and just to follow up on the question, let me just spill any illusions that you might think this is some model or some invention of mine. Actually, this model and this notion of equilibrium have been around for over 50 years, well, actually perhaps 80 years, depending on how you count. But it's often traced back to a civil engineer named Wardrop back in 1952. And for that reason, what I'm calling flows of Nash equilibria often carry his name. They're often called Wardrop equilibria or sometimes user equilibria. I'm going to call them Nash flows uh, to make precise the game theoretic analogy. Uh, other work done in transportation in the 50s, uh, some fundamental facts which are very useful for us. The existence and uniqueness questions about these equilibria will resolve. So in every single network, every single selfish routing network, there exists such a flow of natural equilibrium, and they're pretty much unique. And I'm not going to be super precise about the uniqueness. If you have strictly increasing cost functions, not just non-decreasing, they really are unique. If you have constant functions, you're going to have a very benign type of non-uniqueness that we can safely ignore. Okay, so conceptually, for every network, there exists a unique flow at Nash equilibrium, and that's what we identify with the outcome of selfish behavior, and that's what we're going to be analyzing. Okay. Uh, finally, an important point is that even though this model was introduced by transportation scientists, it was kind of rediscovered in the electrical engineering and networking literature when it was realized that if you use distributed shortest path routing protocols, and if you use these dynamic metrics of these costs on edges as the edge weights, then the fixed points of these selfish routing protocols are precisely the flows of Nash equilibrium as at the front end. Okay, so there's actually a, a rigorous equivalence uh, between the fixed points of shortest path routing protocols using a certain notion of edge metric uh, and these networks that were originally defined in transportation science. Okay, so equally well modeled. Two different things. So I'm almost done completing the model. The final thing I need is an objective function that tells me why I might prefer one rounding of the traffic over another. Okay? So the objective function is going to be called the cost of a flow. For those of you familiar with, for example, min cost flow, it's going to be exactly the same objective function. Uh, intuitively, we just take the cost incurred by all of the traffic and we sum it up over the entire population. That's the objective function. So let me be a little bit more precise. So when there's one unit of traffic, the objective function will be exactly the same as the average cost. So for example, in our two node two link network, if we split the population half half between the two edges, Half of the traffic, those on the top edge, incur cost one half. Half of the traffic, those on the bottom edge, incur cost one. So on average, they incur cost three quarters. So that's going to be the objective function value of this red flow in this two node two link network. Uh, the definition in a more general network is a little bit more complicated, but not by much. So formally, in a general network, if the cost of a path, P, uh, with respect to a flow, F, which is defined as the sum of the costs in the path, then the way we sum up the cost of all of the flow is we look over all paths P, all possible paths on which traffic might be routed. We look at the cost along that path. We look at the amount of traffic that incurs that cost, and we sum up over all of the paths the traffic might be. Okay? So for example, in this green flow in the Brace Paradox network, the cost of this bottom two-hop path will just be the cost of this edge, given that this amount of flow is using it, plus the cost of this edge, given that both of these flow paths are using it. 
that would be the cost of the path, and then we just sum up over all paths. That would be the cost of the flow. Okay? And then this tune and tuning network is a good example just to keep uh, in the back of your mind whatever you want to think about what subjective function really means. Okay? So that's our objective function. So this is a system objective If we minimize this, it would be the system off the exactly. Okay? Exactly. Okay, so but more generally, for any routing of the traffic, a flow at Nash equilibrium, uh, really good flow, really bad flow, this assigns it a numerical value because it's a method by which we can compare uh, in a precise way different possible outcomes. In particular, it gives us a notion of optimum, a flow that minimizes the subjective function we're going to identify as the best imaginable outcome of this traffic routing problem. Okay. Right, so now that we have a precise objective function, we can make precise negative consequences of selfish behavior, inefficiency of selfish routing. Okay? Uh, and this is something that was observed qualitatively way back in 1920 by an economist named Pigou. And so sometimes I'll call this Pigou's example for that reason. Uh, so if we return to the initial 2 node 2 link network, recall that in the selfish outcome, we expect the top edge to be fully congested. Okay, that's this green routing of traffic. Uh, that's, the, that's the flow at Nash equilibrium. And since everyone has cost one, the overall cost of the flow is also one. And then by contrast, the half-half flow, which we observed is not at equilibrium, on the previous slide, we computed its cost, and we got the number three quarters. Okay? So selfish routing is inefficient in the sense that it gives a flow with strictly larger cost than the minimum possible. Okay? It's strictly larger cost than the dictatorial solution of the half-half split. It turns out the half-half split minimizes the cost of this particular network. Now, I'm not going to prove it, but it's easy to prove. And then the phrase, the price of anarchy, is formally defined as the ratio between these two numbers. So the price of anarchy is the extent to which the cost of selfish routing exceeds the optimal cost. So in Kipper's example, the price of anarchy is exactly four-thirds the ratio of the Nash flow cost, the ratio of the optimal cost. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm finally in a position to state the kinds of results we're going to seek out in this talk. What are the desiderata? So we've now seen two simple examples, uh, Pigou's example and also Grace's paradox in which selfish routing is inefficient. We have a way to make this precise by this price of anarchy ratio. And the question we're going to investigate is, well, you know, these are two really pretty simple examples. How inefficient can selfish routing be in general in more realistic networks? When I say more realistic networks, I really mean that along two different axes. Uh, so first of all, and let us we just looked at two different basically toy topologies. And I'm interested in how this inefficiency grows as networks, network topologies become more complicated. That network should grow large and traffic should emanate and be going to many different sources and destinations. And secondly, I also want the cost functions to be more realistic. All we've seen in the examples are simple linear functions, 0, x, and 1. Uh, in practice, for example, from um, you know, Q, on the basis of queuing networks, you have highly nonlinear, much more complicated <coughs> cost functions. I want to understand how the inefficiency grows with more complex, more realistic cost functions. And in particular, the angle, the perspective we want to understand is what are sufficient conditions on a network that ensure that the inefficiency is small, that the outcome of selfish routing is not too far away from the optimal possible outcome. And I hope the motivation for that kind of statement is clear. If you can prove that selfish outcome leads to a, uh, selfish behavior leads to an outcome that's almost optimal, you can have a very laissez-faire approach toward routing that network. Right. Why bother intervening, for example, with some heavy network protocol if the maximum possible benefit is minuscule? Right? Selfish behavior already leads to an almost optimal outcome. So that's the kind of result we're really interested in deriving. Okay. So any questions about what we're after? Because the rest of the talk is basically going to be seeking out results that formalize this. All right, so you know there wouldn't be a talk if I couldn't prove anything interesting about this board. But there is a very compelling piece of bad news that's going to sculpt what kind of guarantees we can possibly achieve. And so now I have to come clean and show you the bad news, show you the bad example that provides some limits on what is achievable along these lines. Okay, so we're going to obtain a bad example by modifying Pigou's example, the two-node two-link network, in a seemingly minor way. Okay. We're going to modify it by replacing the previously linear function x with a highly nonlinear function x to the d. Okay. 
or D here is some large number, I think it was a thousand or a million, something like that. So observation one is that the Nash flow is invariant under this modification. For exactly the same reason as before, all surface traffic will take the top edge and fully congest it and have a cost of one. Okay? So the Nash flow is the same, it has the same cost as before one. What changes is I claim there's an out of equilibrium flow, an unstable flow, with almost zero cost. To obtain that out of equilibrium flow, take an epsilon fraction of the traffic, rip them off the top edge, and sacrifice them to the bottom edge. That gives us this 1 minus epsilon epsilon split of the population. What's the cost of this flow? Well, almost everybody's on the top edge incurring cost, 1 minus epsilon quantity, raised to the D. As D is large, that powers this 1 minus epsilon down to basically zero. So almost everybody is on the top edge and arrives at the destination nearly instantly. Now, it's true that you know, there's a few martyrs who've sacrificed to the bottom edges that take cost one, but there's so few of them, they contribute almost nothing to the average. So overall, the average of the total cost of this red flow is basically zero. And as a result, the outcome of selfish routing with respect to this average cost objective is arbitrarily larger than the cost of the best solution that could be dictated to the traffic. Okay? Even in this basically trivial network topology. So that's the point of this example, is that this gap between the cost of selfish and optimal routing can be arbitrarily large. And in light of this example, in simplicity, you, know, you can justify it asking, you know, what can we possibly hope to prove, given this really simple structure along the lines of our goal? Okay? It turns out there's two different ways that can be used to basically elude this bad example and still derive interesting guarantees on the outcome of selfish behavior. So we'll explore each of those approaches in turn. So I'm going to begin with what's arguably the less natural approach, but it gives a very general result uh, that eventually will have a very nice interpretation. So, but the idea of the first approach is to say, well, you know, we can't prove anything. So the, the, the idea of the first approach is to be a hardliner about the generality that we seek. We're going to insist that we make basically no assumptions whatsoever on the networks that we consider. Now, given the previous example, if we make no restrictions on the networks, we know we can't prove anything about this gap in costs between the optimal and selfish outcome. So we're going to prove something else. We're going to compare the cost of the selfish and the optimal outcome in a different way than merely taking the ratio of the costs. And what we're going to do is we're going to weaken the optimum in a certain precise way. Okay. We're going to make the optimum flow weaker by forcing it to route additional traffic between each source destination pair. And we'll see that that has a natural interpretation by the end of the slide uh, in terms of uh, routing in an over-provisioned network. But let me first make the theorem precise. Okay? So we're going to force an optimal flow to route additional traffic and thereby weaken it. And so while that may seem like an unnatural guarantee right now, at the very least, it gives us a theorem with the best possible set of hypotheses, which is the empty set of hypotheses. For every single network, the following inequality is true. Look at the network. Look at the outcome of selfish behavior. Look at the Nash flow in that network. And look at its cost. That cost is bounded above by the cheapest possible way to route twice as much traffic between each source destination. The rate here is what is that? So the rate here is a vector indexed by source destination pair, which specifies for each source destination pair how much traffic belongs to that source destination pair. So when I write two here, this may be a little confusing. This is a scalar, this is a vector. Everything's double. Everything's double. But if you want, for simplicity, just think about there being one source and one destination, and then it's just twice as much traffic. Because the traffic can start in different places, we double everything. Okay. What are we assuming about the link cost function? Continuous and non-decreasing. And that's it. And that's it. So in particular, one can check this theorem on the one and next to the D example. Okay. I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I'm happy to do it afterwards. Okay. So that's that's the great No assumptions on the topology. Arbitrarily large. Any number of sources and destinations. No assumptions on the cost functions beyond non-decreasing and continuous. What's the significance of the number two when it's not one? So you can replace two with one plus delta if you want. Yeah. And then you get a one over delta. Here. So in fact, the exact same proof that I'll show you at the end of the talk, you'll just see immediately how to generalize it to one plus delta. Okay. All right, so now in addition to being a non-trivial guarantee, in the sense there's no reason a priori to expect this inequality to hold, uh, this has a very clean interpretation. 
in terms of certain commonly studied types of cost functions. Okay? So, in particular, call a cost function, an MM1 delay function, and it has the following form. 1 over u minus x, where here x is the edge congestion, and u can be interpreted as some kind of edge capacity. Okay? So what does this cost function mean? Those of you who work with queuing theory, of course, know exactly what it means. But for the rest of you, if x is 0, it's fully uncongested. The cost here is some small constant, 1 over u. And then as the congestion x approaches the capacity from below, the cost zooms off to infinity. Okay? So this is a cost function with an asymptote right at its capacity. So a syntactically equivalent version of this theorem says the following. Okay, this is a simple algebraic rewriting. That's Instead of weakening the optimum, what we're going to do is give the Nash flow a better network to route. And we'll be trading off additional capacity versus optimal routing. So the precise statement is the following. Uh, take a network, look at the Nash flow after you've doubled the capacity of every edge in the network. Okay? So you give the Nash flow a better network. You give it double the capacity. And the cost of that Nash flow is no more than the cheapest way to route the traffic on the original map. Now, the way I want you to interpret this corollary is as follows. Okay? Suppose you have a network with M and 1 delay functions, and you're unhappy with the performance of self traffic It's too large. The cost is too big. It's too congested. And you were considering maybe implementing some kind of heavy-handed protocol to improve the route. And maybe even say, you know, you were hoping to get optimal route. So what this corollary says is that as long as bandwidth is cheap, don't worry about it. Double the capacity of the network. You will get provably at least as large a benefit in routing performance as if you can actually implement optimal routing in the original network. Okay? So over-provisioning is feasible. It will give you at least as much benefit as complete optimal routing the traffic in the original network. Okay? That is only for one. So there's an analog of this statement for any type of cost function. It just has the cleanest sort of statement for any one function. But it's true that for any kind of cost functions, a sufficient improvement in a certain precise sense gives you the same guarantee. And still you're not assuming differentiability of the cost function? Uh, no. no. Differentiability turns out to not be important. Okay. So that's sort of the cost function. So time permitting, I'm going to actually prove this thing for you at the end of the talk. But before I go down that road, I want to first uh, fulfill this promise of there being two different ways to elude the bad one and the example to get interesting guarantees on selfish behavior. And the second approach, I think, is maybe the more intuitive one, which says, okay, so we have examples where selfish writing is not too bad. For example, the normal figures example. And we have examples where it's really bad. And we want to understand the threshold. So in other words, we're going to be a hardliner about the kind of comparison we want to make. We want to really directly compare the costs of optimal and selfish flows. We know we can't do that in every possible network. How large a class of networks admits an interesting comparison between the cost of these two flows? What are sufficient conditions that equilibria are, are provably not? Okay. So to show you how this works, call a cost function linear. I find might be a better word. I'm going to call them linear. Uh, if it has the form AX plus B, A and B are non-negative constants, can be different for different edges. So this is a mild generalization of the 0, 1, and Xs that we have in our examples. Okay. So that's a strong restriction, and we'll generalize it shortly. But just to give you a sense of the power of this restriction, let me show you the theorem, which says that no matter what network, again, arbitrary topology, arbitrary number of origins and destinations, as long as you make the strong restriction on the cost functions that they're linear, then you can get a very strong direct comparison between the optimal outcome and the self outcome. Specifically, the cost of a Nash flow is no more than four-thirds times that of an optimal flow in the network. Okay, now these flows both route the same amount of traffic, and they're both in exactly the same network. So it says, in a strong sense, self routing is a four-thirds approximation of optimal routing if you have linear cost functions. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, as we said, in most interesting networks, cost functions are nonlinear. And we know we can't prove anything about arbitrary nonlinear functions, but certainly we don't want to be happy just stopping with linear. But so the, the right way to generalize this theorem is to first look at a corollary. And the corollary basically just says, 
This number of four thirds, it's not the first time you've seen it on this slide. When we first introduced the cost and the concept of the price of energy, the ratio of the cost of selfish and optimal flows, we observed that in Pigou's example, in the Tuna Tooling example, which, needless to say, has linear cost function, the gap between selfish and optimal routing is, in fact, four thirds. Okay. All right, so what's the import of that? Well, it naturally shows that the four thirds in the previous theorem can't be replaced by any small, smaller number. Uh, there's only true theorem. Right, that, that theorem is best possible in that sense. But the fact that the lower bound is realized in such a simple network, I think, is worth sort of a little thought, a little discussion. Uh, in particular, I think as soon as you see that selfish routing is inefficient, that it fails to produce an optimal outcome, it's natural to kind of think, you know, why? What makes selfish routing inefficient? Where does the inefficiency come from? And in Pico's example, right, it's really simple to see what's going on. There are two parallel routes one of which, the top route, affords a benefit over the alternative if and only if it's used in moderation. Okay? So the optimal flow, the red flow, sensibly takes advantage of this, uses it in moderation, extracts that benefit. Whereas selfish routers, right, they're completely unable to moderate themselves. So they over-congest the top edge to the point that it may as well not have been there at all. Okay? To the point that it no longer affords any benefit whatsoever because it's over-congested. Okay, fine. So that's, that's, in Pico's example, that's why the Nash flow is inefficient. But as soon as you pass to the realm of arbitrary networks, especially multi-commodity networks, it's natural to expect other problems for self routing to arise. And so just to give a kind of straw man argument, uh, you could think maybe a priori about a network where uh, in selfish routing you have traffic coming from the periphery of a network and sort of colliding in some central core and having all this congestion and it's a disaster, whereas the optimal flow cleverly coordinates the commodities around the periphery. It does way better than the Nash element, even for linear cost functions. And so what this corollary says is, you know, that and all of the strongman arguments are nothing but strong. Right? They're just irrelevant. There's no obstruction for selfish routers optimizing the cost beyond, or at least of any magnitude larger than what you already see in Pigou's example. Really, the whole story is parallel routes, selfish routers are going to one. That's kind of why that explains the worst case inefficiency of selfish routing, at least, at least when you have linear cost function. And so what we don't know is whether that nice interpretation is an artifact of the linearity assumption or something more genuine about the self routing model. So the final theorem I'm going to tell you about today says that it's the latter. So basically what this theorem says, we'll get to the details in a second, what it says is that always the entire explanation is two parallel links and self routers are just one. That's always the whole story. That was not an artifact of linearity. The four thirds, as we know, is an artifact of linearity. The one next to the D examples showed us that. Okay, so how do you formalize that statement? So here's the formal, here's the formal thing. So fix any set of cost functions up front. So in the previous theorem, this set was the set of linear functions. For this theorem, this set can be, for example, the quadratic functions, the cubic functions, those NM1 delay functions, whatever. Fix your favorite set. Then, with respect to that set of allowable edge cost functions, the largest ratio in the costs of selfish and optimal flows that you will ever see in networks with these cost functions is a network that looks exactly like Pigou's example. A network with two nodes, two links, one has a constant function, the other has what is intuitively the steepest cost function in your allowable cost. Okay? So again, this says Pigou-like examples are universal bad examples. For any cost function restriction, you can find an explanation, you can find an example with worst case efficiency loss that's just a 2 2 network. You will never get more inefficiency by permitting larger networks, more origin destination, and so on. Okay. So piggy like examples are universal bad examples. Okay, so this proof I'm definitely not going to have time to talk about, but I do give you, want to give you a taste of sort of the first step. I think the first step is sort of a nice uh, conceptual insight, which has actually been around for decades, but it turns out to be useful in this setting. Uh, so the, the first step of the proof idea is to realize that Nash flows, in addition to being equilibrium, in the sense we've defined, are actually optimizing something, are actually solving a certain minimization. Now, at first, this may seem kind of crazy, right? Because the whole point of these price of questions is that Nash flows aren't minimizing what we want. They're not minimizing the cost. They're sort of inefficient. 
But the point is, there's an artificial objective function, which in the background, they are minimized. Okay? To make this a little more plausible, I want to point out that it just generalizes something that probably most of you learned in electricity and magnetism. Uh, let me see if I can remember the names. About electrical currents in two-terminal uh, networks. Okay? So in, in two-terminal networks, you have, I hope I remember all, you have Kirchhoff's law and Ohm's law and Thompson's principle. And I forget which is which. One says you have basically conservation of electrical currents at nodes, completely analogous to conservation of traffic at nodes in our traffic networks. Another one says that the, um, was it the voltage drop is equalized across all two terminal paths. In exactly the same way, cost is equalized by Nash flows in these traffic networks. And the final one, Thompson's principle, says that in addition to electrical currents being equilibrium, in the sense that it equalizes these voltage drops, it also minimizes the dissipated energy for the network. Okay, so in that sense, electrical current is both an equilibrium and solving an optimization problem. And what's going on here is nothing more than a suitable mathematical generalization of that exact same duality. Okay? And so then the reason you can upper bound the inefficiency of these Nash flows is precisely because these, they're optimizing this a sort of artificial objective function that turns out to enjoy close proximity to the real objective. So they're not optimizing the right function, but they're optimizing something pretty close. And that's the intuition for why you can get some kind of bound on the maximum possible inefficiency of this equation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 a comment about this. Uh, 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 I'm not sure if it, uh, is exactly correct or not. I think uh, uh, probably uh, the net equivalent is to, uh, I mean, it is optimal in the sense is for fair sharing, fair sharing the benefit and the cost. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to obtain the uh, uh, optimal cost, you know, you, you may need some, uh, some party to uh, sacrifice and some fair benefit. Right. So this is not acceptable. That's right. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you. So the, the objection is essentially that because of the objective function we've introduced, averaging the cost of the entire population, in order to minimize that objective function, you may need to do something like we've seen in examples, which is sacrifice a small portion of the population to a large, to a large panel for the benefit of the rest of the population. And there's some philosophical argument about whether such a flow should be deemed profitable or not. But let me point something out, which is that, in, I mean, I think Nash flows are inefficient in a deeper sense. I don't think it's an artifact of the subjective function. And to point that out, I want to remind you of Grace's paradox. Where in the right-hand network, in the equilibrium, everyone has cost. Whereas there's a different solution, the red routing of traffic in the right-hand network, where everybody has cost, 1.5. So in the selfish outcome, it's possible that absolutely everybody is worse off than in the optimal outcome. Now, if you want to do you change the objective function to sort of zoom in on this issue a little bit more, but the main qualitative point I want to make now is that this inefficiency is not an artifact of my particular objective. The objective function, I think, sort of illuminates the inefficiency, but you can choose different objective functions to do that. But I really think this inefficiency is much more fundamental, I don't think. Uh, and so the artificial, in particular, back to the proof of that second theorem, the artificial objective function that Nash flows are minimizing doesn't seem to admit a natural interpretation. You don't seem to be able to turn that into a statement that says, oh, if only you had this other fairer objective function, it's the right concept. So this artificial objective function is nothing more than a construct for the purposes of that proof. Unfortunately, it doesn't even have natural sociological implication. I wish it did, but this is. Okay. So this whole theory, you could rework for the objective functions if you want, but this inefficiency is not going to go away if you change the objective function to anything else remotely reasonable. Yeah. Okay. But you said that the national equilibrium holds the cost function of all the paths are the same. I, what I'm saying is, for any given restriction on the cost function, I can exhibit a worst possible example. So a different way to put it is, give me any network. So fix, fix a restriction on cost function. For example, some kind of queuing theoretic function or some kind of polynomial. Give me any network with those kinds of cost functions. But so what you said before this, you said that oh. at the at the group there, all the paths have the same cost function. I think I'm getting to it. I think, I think I'm about to get to what I mean. So then I can exhibit to you a new network which is very simple, in which that has at least as large an inefficiency. Okay, so give me an arbitrary complicated network. 
obeying some cost restriction, I'll give you a dirt simple network obeying that same cost restriction with at least as large an inefficiency. And what do I mean by simple? Two nodes and two links. One of the links has a cost, has a constant cost function. And the other link has what is intuitively the steepest <coughs> cost function in the allowable class. Okay? And so you have to make precise what steepest means for an arbitrary class, but that's not really good. So when if you want to find the real optimum, yes. we have basically a transition there will be the derivative of the cost to be equal, not the cost. I see what you mean. I see. Yes, that's right. So here that's right. what you're saying is basically you know, the Nash equivalent is the optimum for the integral of the cost function or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. I really didn't expect anyone to see that online. Exactly. Right. That is, in fact, the artificial objective function for this one. So the question really just kind of um, basically just stated exactly what this minimization problem is. And basically, it's not natural. You basically take the cost functions, you integrate them, and if you know some basically convex programming, then you can kind of apply so-called conditional integral conditions to recover the Nash equivalent equation problem. So for the very sophisticated among you, that's sort of the proof of where this comes from. I mean, you're not done with the theorem as soon as you've done that, but that's exactly how you make that first step of yourself. Excellent. Excellent. Is there a paper that Exactly. So, exactly. So, uh, so, exactly. So, um, if we go back to my history slide, and this book is exactly where, so like I said, that idea's been around for decades, and this is the record. So they actually proved existence and uniqueness via reference to this artificial objective function. And what's amazing, so this has been generalized in the game theory literature to this so-called theory of uh, potential functions and potential games. What's really nice here is there's this uh, structural property that's long been known to have good properties in the game theory literature, and now it turns out they have this completely different use that no one realized they had, which was down in the inefficiency of the equilibrium. They've been used for 50 years to prove existence of equilibrium, and only in the last few years have they realized that actually it's a great tool for down the inefficiency of equilibrium as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a standard tool from transportation and game theory used, I would argue, Some more questions. Um, good. So, just to reinforce this point and make sure everyone understands exactly what this previous theorem says, it's a qualitative theorem. Right? For any possible cost restriction, it, it tells you what the worst case examples are. It's not a quantitative theorem in the sense that it doesn't tell you what the worst case ratio, what the gap between the selfish and optimal outcome is in those worst case examples. And as we've seen, right, the factor of four thirds is an artifact of the linearity assumption. In other words, we have this family of networks, one and next to the D, where the four thirds went to infinity. Okay? So we were never expecting the four thirds to reach far beyond the linearity assumption. And now that we have this very powerful theorem telling us what the worst case examples are, it of course reduces the question of understanding the price of anarchy, understanding the worst case gap, to a triviality. Like given, a, given a restriction on the cost function, just write down this simple network, compute the gap, compute the price of energy, and the theorem tells you that's the largest possible ratio you will ever see in any network obeying those cost function restrictions. So for example, one application of that theorem is says, well, instead of linear, think about polynomials with bounded degree and non-negative coefficients. What that theorem gives you back is that those one and x to the d examples are the worst possible among all uh, networks with any of the origin and destination pairs. Okay? So this is the sort of proper generalization of the four-thirds for linear. So then you just do a back-of-the-envelope calculation, understand exactly what the price of energy is in these examples, and you find that it grows sublinear. The constants here are quite small. So for example, if you have an application where you're content sort of uh, you know, modeling the dependence on congestion with degree eight polynomials, you get a worst-case ratio of something like three. The four-thirds becomes three for degree eight polynomials. How easy is to construct the uh, given network in the first time? Yeah. How easy is to construct the whole case? It sort of depends. Um, because yeah, I mean, this argument depends on that. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a calculus problem, which can get very messy if you have a very messy set of cost functions. Um, arbitrary Arbitrary topology. Um, so the topology goes away. It, isn't it always this ST with two parallel sets? Yes. Yeah, no, you don't have to solve for the topology. This is always the topology. 
The only thing you have to solve for is this cost function. No, I mean the topology of the reason level. Uh -huh. If I give you a oh. topology of the reason level, okay. and a cost function here, okay. then you have to compute the worst case example. It's going to be a 2 node 2 path uh, example that will work. Sure. And then you have to compute the parameters of that. How are you using the data? Um, so, I mean, if you just give me a network and you want to know what the optimal is, yeah, I mean, that's basically convex right. filtering. It's basically equivalent to multi commodity and convex okay. main cost multi commodity flow. This is a little bit different in the sense that I'm more thinking about restrictions on cost functions. I'm thinking of a sphere being parameterized by sets of cost functions rather than networks. Right? And so then, so, just, so you just solve a path this problem to figure out exactly what this cost function is. And for most natural classes of cost functions you can think of, you can just solve. So, for example, for MM1 delay functions, is kind of queuing theory functions. You can solve it. Sometimes you have to use Mathematica, but, you know, it's doable. And so, in particular, just to illustrate it for these degree bound polynomials, you can precisely work out this dependence on the degree bound. And what you find out is that the price of remains small unless your cost functions are extremely nonlinear. So this is basically a wide-ranging wide -ranging generalization of that four-thirds linear. It really says, we know we can't prove anything about this worst-case ratio in general, but using this paradigm, we can prove small constants for lots of different special classes. Okay. And, the, and the constant depends only on the type of the constant. Exactly. They never depend on topology. That's really, the, I think, the surprising insight that emerges from the second level. The topology never matters from the perspective of worst-case analysis. Only the cost functions matter. I think, that's, I think that's maybe the most surprising lesson to learn from the entire time. Okay, good. So I'm definitely going to skip the proof of uh, this theorem. You know, it's doable in sort of 10 minutes. So those of you who are interested, I'm happy to do it afterwards or later in the day. This is the whole proof. That's it. Summary, I, hopefully you haven't forgotten the theorems because we didn't do the proof. Um, so, again, maybe just a, a very quick recap. Like the whole point was that selvage routing has inefficiency. There's inefficiency broadly when there's selvage behavior. And in this particular routing application, we saw very concretely how there's inefficiency. And I've tried to give you a couple paradigms for how you can bound and analyze this inefficiency. One, basically, you solve inefficiency by over-provisioning. And the other, you restrict cost functions for lots of different special cases. You actually get a uh, very small balance on the worst case inefficiency. So let me just wrap up with one quick slide. Uh, trying to answer the question, you know, how much are these results particular to sort of this particular model I, I've shown you, and how much are they more general? And uh, at first it wasn't clear. You know, when the papers first started coming out, it wasn't clear how many results of this form we'd get. And uh, now it looks like actually for many different types of game theoretic applications and for really wide ranging general generalizations of this routing model. Uh, you can still say intelligent things and non trivial things um, about the worst case inefficiency of equilibria. So I don't have any references about sort of network design and bandwidth allocation applications, which people have also worked on, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. But let me just mention a couple, and because it's easy to state, let me just mention a couple of the different directions in which people have extended this routing work. Um, so one thing I said earlier in the talk is it's not important that there's a large population of small users. What is important is that flow is fractional. So if you have a lot of flow controlled by a single user, they should be able to route over many paths. If you relax that assumption, you can still get bounds on the inefficiency, but the bounds are much larger. So for example, you have exponential dependence on the degree bound instead of linear like we saw. But for fractional flow, all of the bounds, all of the theorems remain true. Similarly, you can generalize you know, away from the network structure. You can generalize the cost edges, um, the notion of cost functions, so they depend on the entire traffic pattern rather than being separable cost functions on different edges, uh, and so on. And again, if you have particular interests, come talk to me afterwards, but I'm pretty much out of time, so I think I'll wrap up here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll be around the table at 2 o'clock in, uh, in the conference, and you're all invited to come. But we have time for questions. So if you have a different uh, class functions, all polynomial with different degrees, it will be the, the largest degree that matters? That's right. That basically shows the worst case. Yeah, in all, all that's that's right. Right. So if you take the set of all cost functions to be all polynomials with the most you can, I'll give you back the pig network just with that case. Any other questions? I've looked into the following. Correct or not? So I'm actually quite good at it. It is a. Uh, 
is a solution uh, that can be friendly with the minimum cost. Fairness in the sense that friendly in the sense that uh, the cost and benefit are shared equally by all parties. So there is this mm -hmm. very strong diversity. Right. Yeah. I mean, so in the national and the right hand network, the equilibrium is the greatest one. And I don't know, I basically don't know any way to justify the greens love. Other than unless you take the national position. Maybe the support of that uh, it's standard that the transportation, every time you study building a new highway to do a study of this brain's paradox to make sure that uh, you're not making things worse. Uh, why do transportation sound like the order of equilibrium at equal time, right? That's the idea there. So, right. Okay. I mean, it's, it's sometimes this show is so-called Pareto inefficiency. Let me, uh, I mean, as soon as you're Pareto inefficient, you're basically not. Let me ask you something. Yeah. Ask yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first one is, uh, suppose I say in the paradigm, I look at the uh -huh. where the agents are actually it's not, but including intermediate nodes. Where agents are? The agents are intermediate nodes in a path. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because here it's a stock end to end. So now every node will try to do routing, but it will do next call routing. Okay. Okay. What can be said in that case in terms of? So, I mean, the, the one thing that can, the one thing that works out quite nicely is this thing I mentioned extremely briefly. Um, so now the class has an iron, so just you find this piece on the Yeah, yeah. So as long as you don't introduce any initial incentive issues, there is a sort of nice equivalence between this sort of. I mean, so in networking you would call. I mean, it seems like the model's talking about source reference. Yeah, but this depends on this and the cost and the weight of it. On the cost. This one too, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you need to. There needs to be. You need to be using the right cost functions for this to make sense. I mean, uh, so are you saying? I mean, as soon as as soon as people. As soon as I deviate from that, I deviate from that, and I still have a distributed algorithm, and I still want to give a gain, right? What's known? Right? So, yeah, so I, I don't know anything beyond this, basically. Because again, there is very interesting to try to understand yeah. uh, what is the limit. There are some results to try to balance, but yeah. not. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you, I mean, you can think about issues where you know intermediate nodes don't particularly. Right. So maybe this is what you're saying. Intermediate nodes don't really care. You know, they might drop stuff, right. or they might you know, forward it along some stupid. Yeah, they still want to. Uh, there is a there is first game where if I don't promote oh, yours, okay. don't, right. don't well, promote mine. Right. So that's right. So, so it's so. like the ISP where you said, okay, I can be a bad guy up to a certain point right. because after a while nothing gets propagated. That's right. That's right. So there, actually, there is there is some nice work that I don't understand the details very well. I got named Pedro Ferreira, right. who's a recent senior graduate. Yeah. He did actually use. You know, basically, this model. I know one of Ferris. Yeah, but not exactly. So that's that. He sort of, and you know, I'm sure there's still stuff to be done. But he actually doesn't know. Then what if I have agents? Yeah. They are not all uh, equal. And what if I have agents that their decisions are what's known and untreated? What, and actually, I know you're working this correlated, right? So they are they they are not completely independent, right? Right. So, the, in other words, if I go to a more generalization of the mass, right. like in almonds and all that, then what happens? Like, can you prove similar things? I actually don't know what, I've never thought about what the set of so called correlative equilibrium is for some of you. I mean, in some sense, I mean, on the worst case side, I mean, uh, in Picker's example, in 202 of networks, which are universal bad examples, uh, I mean, they're a sort of dominant strategy. I mean, what, the equilibrium is a sort of dominant strategy. Okay. So, it's, that's very robust to equilibrium refinements. So you basically, I mean, in selfish routing, I'm trying to give an intuitive argument that says in selfish routing games, you can't really drop the price of energy by looking at the equilibrium of refinements. Right? What's going on in Peter's example is kind of so robust to those kinds of, you know, the changing the equilibrium concept is not going to change what emerges in the figure that works, So, So that kind of prevents you from really proving better bounds on the efficiency. Yeah, I mean, you could, what you could do is look at correlated equilibrium and then look at the best correlated and try and prove something about that. But that, I mean, then you sort of lose some of the appeal of these, of these worst case kind of. And the last question I have is, uh, which has a, a second one which I won't ask, 
So very recently, I've done some work um, which looks at different kinds of performance metrics, but not multi criteria. I don't know any work that's had a multi criteria. Okay, so the work of Chris and others on multi criteria and interpreting the internet on the basis of trade offs has not taken a reactive case. Yeah, I have not seen any work that combined kind of these ideas of analyzing inefficiency with the multi criteria objectives of talking to Chris. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Suppose that in your single set of uh, every patient that that does a uh, sacrifice gets a price right. for that. Right. So how does that change? Your so so it sort of depends exactly. I mean, there definitely are <laughs> models of pricing from which you can basically elicit the optimal solution. So in particular, I mean. I mean it's perfect to do over there, so called Kagobian taxes, which is basically charging the congestion externality, of course, people who internalize the congestion externality. Um, and there's sort of standard guarantees that say you get the ultimate solution. Um, so, you know, if you're satisfied, you know, so if you, you know, there's a bunch of problems that we call the question of implementability, but, you know, if you're, if you're allowed to charge prices for every edge, and you can have arbitrarily low prices, and everyone kind of, um, trades off, delay, money in the same way. So there's a sort of long list of assumptions. But if you make a sufficiently long, long list of assumptions, you can actually get back to the optimal solution. And I've done a little bit of work that tries to relax various assumptions and get to a different progress depending on which number you take. So the answer to your question is sort of a function of what assumptions you have to do. But in general, um, I mean, so the qualitative thing to take away is you know, pricing can help in many different situations. And so that goes back to, you know, at the very beginning I said, first, we just want to quantify efficiency. There's this obvious question, when it's large, what do you do? And that's definitely one of the directions that's been partially explored is pricing. Another one's happening too. And so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an obvious question. What do you do when you see it? And it's still a good question. Okay, let's take the speaker again.